Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 5. This is a great verse. I say that all the Bible is great. Amen. I, I would have to agree there. It's the Word of God. But this one should be a special blessing to those of us that trusted the Lord Jesus as our Savior. John 5, 24. A great, what we call, assurance verse. Did you know it's good to get assurance? Yeah, Isn't it right. good to be assured that when you die, you're going to heaven and not hell? Amen. Isn't it good to be assured that you are not going to burn forever and ever? Did you know this Bible teaches that people who do not trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior burn forever and ever? Do your loved ones know that you believe that? People you work with know that you believe that? Lord, put some uh, conviction on all of us there, people. Amen. I don't mean that needs to be the first thing we ever say to somebody. <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> I believe we can use a little wisdom. But if somebody's known us for decades, they ought to know we believe what this Bible says. Amen. Yep. You say, well, if you talk about hell, that uh, people think you hate them. No, the Lord Jesus Christ loved more than anybody ever loved any of us enough to die on the cross for us. And he talked more about hell than any character in the whole Bible. Amen. That's a show of love for people that you don't want them to go there. All right, John chapter 5, verse 24. If you want to be assured of some things, here's a great verse. Yeah. Verily, verily means truly, truly, or surely, surely. I say unto you, Jesus says, this is true, and I'm saying it unto you. If Jesus says something, you can count on it. Amen. Any man or woman says something to you, let me just be honest with you. They've lied before, and they're probably going to lie again. Mm. But Jesus, you can count. It said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, that's what we call present tense, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. I want to preach this morning on three essential truths, three absolute important truths that you need to settle in your life. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take the Word of God and apply it to the hearts of the listeners. Lord, I pray that we would all examine ourselves and be sure who we have trusted as our Savior. And Lord, we thank you that we can be sure that if we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're safe. We're saved. It is settled according to your word, and there is no higher insurance or assurance than the word of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us every good gift that we've ever had. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. This is one of the great assurance verses. If you're dealing with somebody and you want them to know for sure that they're saved and you want to be sure if they're saved. If they have heard his word and believed on him that sent me, they have everlasting life, Amen. present tense. You say, but what if they mess up? What if they don't get baptized in the right church or give enough money to some charitable cause or do some good work? Look what the rest of it says. And shall not come in the condemnation. It not only covers your present, it covers your future. Amen. Amen. Nothing shall separate us, Paul said. And he gives a big long list of things that never separate us from the love of Christ. And one of them is things to come. Anything that might come in the future will not separate you from the love of Christ. Now I'll tell you what it can do. It can separate you from him and you and him being close fellowship. Yeah. It can kind of hurt the friendship. <coughs> You've got some people you love very dearly, I bet, that you and them aren't real close. Because one or the other has done some things that offended the other, or, or both. It didn't change the love, but it might have changed the closeness of the fellowship. Yeah. But as far as your salvation, as far as your eternal destiny, that thing is settled when you believe the Word of God. Now, there are three uh, essential truths here taught by our Lord, and they're all greatly attacked. One thing you can count on is anything right will be attacked. 
Bob Jones Sr. said the door to the room of success swings on the hinges of opposition. You're not going to have it easy in this life. Anything you ever try to do right, there's going to be loved ones and people you thought you could count on go right up against you. And you're trying to do right the best you know. And sometimes that makes people quit. Well, just, let me, just go ahead and be forewarned. Anytime you do right, there will be people trying to stop you. We're in the football playoff season. And uh, if one guy is running the football trying to score a touchdown, there's a guy on the other team trying to knock him down. I saw, man, I saw the meanest thing last night. A guy was just trying to catch a touchdown pass for his team. That's all he was trying to do. And a guy from the other team hit him and just about knocked him out. Amen. Let me tell you about the devil. He is on the other team. Yeah. And just as soon as you start, start trying to score, and forgive me for using this figurative expression, score a touchdown for Jesus, the devil... Couldn't they? You know they've got this targeting penalty now, where you can't hit them with the crown of your helmet on the on their helmet, you know, because it might give them a concussion or hurt them real bad. The devil ain't worried about targeting penalties. He'll kill you if he can. Amen. Amen. The Lord had to tell the devil when he let him attack Job. He had to say, "But you spare his life." Why did he bother saying that? I'll tell you why. Because the devil will happily kill God's people if he can, and he'll do anything up to and including that. You have a real enemy against you. So these great truths, as great as they are and as simple as they are, and who in their right mind could be against these things, they're all attacked. Just like all good and right things are. All right, now the first one is the revelation. He says, he that heareth my word. The revelation is attacked by unsaved infidels discrediting it. And unfortunately, even by some saved people correcting it, arresting it. There are saved people that don't want the Word of God preached. There's something about it that rubs them, rubs them wrong. Amen. They'll go in there and they'll get some liberal uh, translation and try to change great truths from God's holy Word. Can you imagine such a thing? And them saved! Now we know about the infidels, and, and that's, that's bad enough. There's some saved people who don't care for the pure Word of God. That's why we don't stand for by correcting the Word of God here at Victory Baptist Church. Amen. We believe the King James Bible, and we get it. There's some people that haven't had all the teaching on it, but we wish they would have. And, you know, we try to be gracious to them. I don't want you to think we're unkind. But you'll not hear it corrected here by somebody that is in any sort of a leadership position, that's for sure. He that heareth my word. Did you know what you ought to be doing, Christian? You ought to be making sure people hear his word any way you can. If you can support missionaries that are out putting out his word, do it. If you are called to preach, do it. If you've got a loved one that doesn't know the gospel, tell them. And if, if that doesn't seem to be your gift and the Lord doesn't seem to open a door, do all those supporting things. Show them you love them. Show them you care about them so they'll be open to hear the gospel. Um, we have people that take food so that we can preach up here at the mission. You know what that is doing? That is supporting uh, when you help take care of this building and grounds and support the ministry here at uh, Victory, you're helping take care of some things so that we can get the word out. There are people that give so we can be out on the radio. We couldn't do it. You know what? It, it costs money. A lot of things that spread the word of God cost some money. When you, when you give, you know what you're doing? You're trying to spread the word of God. Just because you're not called to preach, just because you don't have the gift of gab, doesn't mean that, number one, you can't be involved, and number two, you won't get some rewards for it. Remember the Old Testament passage it talked about the ones that stay by the stuff get some of the reward just like the ones that go out and buy hey listen if you're staying by the stuff we couldn't do it without you Amen. don't think that your thing your job is unimportant but i will say this be busy about the lord's work find something you can do that helps the word of god <clears throat> help it because there's something all of us can do we may not be the ones called to preach we may not be the ones moving you know over to a foreign country overseas to preach it, but we can support somebody who is. We can let them know we love them. We can support them in a number of ways. So number one, spreading the word, the revelation. Second, the requirement. Did you know there's a requirement for what Jesus is talking about here? He says, Heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me. Most of the religions of the world attack that very thing. They don't want it as simple as believing. They want some works involved. 
They want uh, you to earn it. They want you to join their church and consider yourself one of their number. They want you to get book ties. They want you to do this. They want you to do that. They want you to keep their rules. Now, don't misunderstand. We're going to have a baptism. We're a Baptist church. We believe in baptizing, don't we? As a matter of fact, I probably haven't made as much of that as I should have over the years. Just to tell you the truth about it. But that isn't what saves you. That's what shows now that I am saved, Amen. I'm going to follow Jesus. Amen. Now, if you stay at victory very long, I'll tell you what you'll hear. You'll hear some emphasis on works. You need to be working for one of the reasons you get saved is for, to work for the Lord. So we don't hesitate to talk about works. We just know it's not what saves you. Amen. So he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, there's the requirement, hath everlasting life. So we've seen the revelation, the requirement, here's the result. Hath everlasting life. Now how much would somebody pay to have the secret to help you live forever. I mean, doctor bills are pretty high just to get you over the flu sometimes. Doctor bills are definitely pretty high when it comes to a surgery, aren't they? What if a doctor said, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you eternal life. Reckon how much he'd charge. <laughs> uh, it would be an astronomical price. As a matter of fact, I can tell you exactly what the price is. It's the lifeblood of the Son of God. Amen. You got that much? <laughs> I bet you don't. <laughs> There is nothing, you that have children, what is more valuable to you than the life of the your child? Mm. Now here's God Almighty, the head of the universe, and the lifeblood of his son, reckon what that's worth to him. The one that has a city where there's a street of gold and gates of pearl and walls of jasper. I mean, somebody on that level, and yet we're talking about the lifeblood of his son. That's the most, we can't even imagine how valuable that is. Amen. And that was the price. Daddy. Half everlasting life. And you know what that's offered to you for? For free. The one requirement is trust him for it. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at these uh, here for a little bit. I went longer in my introduction than I meant to. <laughs> All right. Number one, the revelation. Heareth my word. John, uh, John chapter 8, verse 26. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. You know what Jesus said he did? He said, I speak to the world the words I heard from God. You know what our job is, Christians? Take the words that we hear from God. How does he speak to us? In a Bible. And give them to the world. All right? That's what Jesus did. If we want to follow Jesus, that's what we should be doing. John 14, 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Jesus said, you keep my sayings. And by the way, this isn't just me saying this. This is coming from the Father. When you preach the word of God, when you witness for the Lord, it ought to be true of what you're saying, that this isn't just my opinion, this is what the Bible says. The revelation. Number one, it comes from hearing God's word. He that heareth my word. God help us do a better job of making sure people hear God's word. I'm going to read a famous passage to you from Romans chapter 10 about these things, about the word of God being spread. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? That's our job as a church is to send some people out preaching. How beautiful, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 17 then says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You do not have a better job in your life than to make sure people hear the word of God. Amen. That's number one. The Bible says that's how faith comes. It comes by hearing God's word. I'll tell you something else. It, this salvation that we're talking about and passing into everlasting life comes by believing or accepting God's word. I hate to say this, but there are people who hear God's word and couldn't care less about it. 
You, they step into a place and God's word is being preached and it's just dull and boring. I mean, it's just nothing like the YouTube videos they watch. <laughs> They're just not nearly the colors. They're just not nearly the funny jokes. They're just not nearly the naked people. They're just not nearly the excitement or whatever it is that gets them. It just doesn't thrill them. And yet it's the thing that gives eternal life. And yet it's the reason the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. When you hear it, you should believe it. Hebrews 12, 4 says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Can you imagine the word of God coming? And you couldn't care less. I'm sorry, I'm just not into that. That's not interesting. What if you got a personal letter from the president or a senator? Reckon you'd tell your mom about that? Reckon you'd be interested? Would you have not told about that at the last Christmas gathering you were just at? Oh, yeah. What if you got a message from God? God! My, that ought to get our attention. Yes. That should have our reference. That should certainly have our acceptance and our belief. No wonder the word of God didn't profit them. They didn't believe it. John chapter 12 says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said, said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. So it comes by hearing God's word. It comes by believing or accepting God's word. I'll tell you something else. It comes by admitting that the true God is Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Well, if you don't think Jesus has any authority behind him, what good would it do that he did say it unto you? Yeah. If you just thought he was an obscure carpenter that didn't matter, that carried a sheep around once in a while on his shoulder... But he didn't have any authority from God. What would it matter that he did say it? The whole reason it matters is because of who he is. Amen. The son of God. 1 John 2.23 Whosoever denieth the Son hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. You see how the Bible puts the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father equal? Sometimes when people are talking about the Lord Jesus and talking about his deity, they say he is co-equal and co-existent with the Father. What they're saying is, because he is the Son of God, he's right with the Father. He inherits everything that the Father has, if that could be possible. But it's one God, but he's in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So it comes by admitting that the true God is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Here's the great thing about the Lord Jesus being the Son of God. That means he's able to save you. He's got the power to do it. I hate to even say this. It sounds so irreverent, but just to show you how ridiculous it is to trust anyone else for your salvation. What if I or any other human came and said, don't worry, I'll take care of you. I'll be sure you have eternal life. You know I can't give you eternal life. I couldn't even get by with that. You know there are some religions that think there are some men that can pretty much give them eternal life. Take something. There's only one. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Isn't that a blessing? He is able to save them to the uttermost. That means all the way, as far as you can imagine. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. So number one is the revelation, heareth my word. Number two is the requirement, believeth on him. That's what we see here in John 5, 24. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you received the Lord Jesus? You say, well, I, I, I try to do the best I can. Well, amen, but have you received the Lord Jesus? Well, I, I go to church, you know, when I have time. I, I understand, but have you received the Lord Jesus? That is a different matter. He died on that cross and shed that blood and then was buried and then rose again and he did that for you. The rest of that verse that I quoted a minute ago said uh, he is able to save them to the uttermost ends up saying, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Did you know one of the reasons Jesus lives forever is to make intercession for you? What a wonderful thought! That's one of the reasons he lives. That's what that verse says. He ever liveth to make intercession mm -hmm. for them. Wow, what a wonderful thing. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now here's what believing does include that some people sometimes mistake for works. It does include repentance. Repentance is a big change of mind. Repentance, some people illustrate as you're going one way and then you turn around and go the other. That sounds like a work at first. But remember, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and five minutes ago you did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what you've just done? You just went like this and went the opposite way. You went from not believing to believing. That's a big turnaround. Amen. Especially when it's in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. That's a big change. You mean to tell me the God of this universe, the biggest, most important character there could ever possibly be, you did not believe on him. Now you do believe on him. And that's not going to make a big change in, the, in your thinking, in your life, in every way. It's not that those changes are what saves you, but they sure will happen. Amen. That's what the Bible is talking about when it talks about repentance. Repentance. When I was in Bible school, they said, Repentance in the heart of a sinner creates a momentum that makes belief easier. You will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't have repentance. Because you haven't been believing on him. Repentance is when you make that big change and all of a sudden start trusting him. You were trusting yourself. You were trusting your family. You were trusting your religion. You were trusting your whatever. And all of a sudden you're just trusting him. That's a big change. That's what, that's what we refer to when we refer to repentance. That wholesale turnaround. And yes, it usually does include some other things. Now, as sure as I give you my little list of things that it should change, yours will be different because your background is different. But don't tell me you have that big of a change and it doesn't change anything. Of course it does. So the requirements is believe upon him. That's why we say there is repentance involved. Acts 17.30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the repentance coming right before the faith. All right, so it includes repentance. But at its heart, it is that you believe on Jesus Christ. Because the last part of that verse I just quoted said, and faith or belief toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. What is faith? The Bible defines faith for us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. So faith is believing something you can't see and prove. You know what? You, you can't see and prove eternal life, can you? Give me, show me physically, on paper or in some other literal physical way, how you know that you're going to be saved 10,000 years from now and still living. The only thing we can do is the Word of God. Amen. That's faith. There's nothing about, is there something in your body that looks like it's going to last the next, for all of eternity? Why, no. It looks like all the others that die. There's something different on the inside. There's something that you can only see through the eyes of faith. You must believe. I'll tell you something else. It includes personal acceptance. I have known people that thought Jesus died for the whole world. Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. But they still weren't saved. How can you think Jesus is the Savior of the whole world 
And yet you're not be saved. I'll tell you why. Because you've never received him as your Savior. Amen. But he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Thou is a good old King James word that is singular. It means you personally. You don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of the whole wide world and get saved. You believe on the Thou shalt believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a personal thing. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Has everlasting life is the result of so he has everlasting life. What in the world could this mean? When I studied literature in school, we came to the Epic of Gilgamesh, a very ancient literature. And you know what it asked? How can a man live forever? People have been wondering about that for a long time. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us, He that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. There are a lot of people that say, well, have you believed on the Lord and been baptized and joined the church and done this and that? And they say, yes, I have. And they say, oh, well, good. Then you know you're going to heaven when you die? I say, well, I hope so. <laughs> well, wait a minute. If you've done all the things that their religion teaches that you have to do to get saved, what are you doing saying, I hope so? These things write on to you that you may know that you have everlasting life. The Bible says you can know. Yes. But if you believe your works are involved in it, I'll grant you, you don't ever know. Because who knows? You might get under some bad stress and fall into some great sin that make you lose it if you could. It's not up to you. Amen. It is from him. Yeah. Notice the wording of this verse, have, present tense, everlasting life. You have it right now. You don't get up there to glory and on judgment day, see if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds or see if you did something bad enough after you got saved to lose it. No. Half everlasting life. Present tense, you have it right now. Praise the Lord. John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Present tense. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Oh, no. There's the negative side of that great truth I just gave you. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved right now. You have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're lost right now. Mm -hmm. But you still can be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice it doesn't say because they did something real grossly sinful. No, because they have not, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's the thing that offends God is when you reject his Son. Don't get me wrong, he's a holy God and he is offended by our sins. He doesn't care for them at all. But if there is one that outranks all the others, it is disrespecting and disregarding and having no use for his son who loved you enough to die on a cross for you and shed his blood for you and come up the third day for you and ever lives to make intercession for you. And you say, I couldn't care less. Where's the ball game? Where's the movie? Where's the whatever? There's the one that will get you. John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son <coughs> hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. All these are present tense words. The wrath of God abideth on him. You know why people are miserable right now, even though it's not judgment day yet, even though they're not in hell yet, you know why they're miserable? Because the wrath of God abideth on him present tense. Not one of these days on Judgment Day, he's going to be in bad shape then. No, he's already in bad shape now. And that's why he goes to drugs and alcohol, and that's why they go to illicit uh, relationships, and that's why they try this and that and everything to distract them, because there's something missing in their lives, and they're miserable without it, and they're looking for it. And Jesus is saying, I've already supplied it all, and he's standing there with open arms saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And they're saying, I couldn't care less about none of that. Where's something that's entertaining for me to look at or listen to? Or What about the one that can offer eternal life? Amen. Half everlasting life. But I love that it takes care of your future. Shall not come into condemnation. 
Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation unto them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Yeah. You know what? If you're in Christ Jesus, and you walk after the Spirit, not the flesh, there's no condemnation on you. Amen. Now, that counts. It's from God. Now, there will be people in this world that will go against you. There will be, I'm sorry to tell you, some saved people <clears throat> get a little burr under their saddle about it. There will be all kinds of opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil because they don't want you to do it. But the condemnation that matters, the condemnation from God, you don't have any. You Amen. received his son. You say, oh, but you don't know what I've done. Yeah, but when you received his son, that made up for it. I assure you. That's the main thing he's concerned with. As a matter of fact, that's why his son died. He already knew about the sins you had committed and made allowance for them in the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood washed all those sins away. If you took it, you took the thing that paid all your tickets, Amen. that paid all of your fines, yes. that took your prison time, that took your execution. I can only say that because the Lord Jesus died for you. Why in the world would you die when he's already died for you? Amen. The results, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Now look at these blessed words. But is passed from death unto life. I talked to Aunt Abby, our resident English teacher, and I think she said this is what you call present perfect tense. <laughs> Meaning it is true right now. Is passed from death. You don't have to say, I hope I'll be okay. You are passed from death unto life. The Amen. transaction's already done. Tis done. The great transaction's done. You are on the good side. You are on the living side. Revelation chapter 20. There is a second death talked about. And that's the thing you get to miss if you've already passed from death unto life. Second death comes up in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. It says, In death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You might have looked down there and said, oh, wait a minute. I'm in that list. If nothing else, I've definitely lied. And it says all those people get the second death. Uh, well, all but one category. The ones that have passed from death unto life. What in the world did they do to get that? He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So that verse overrides the other verse. Amen. You got out of the second death yes. because you are already passed from Amen. death unto life. You know, you do not have to give one dime to any religious group, including this church or me or any missionary or any preacher or any godly person that you think. That will not help your salvation. Amen. Now, if you want to help spread the word of God because you have free of your own free will and on your own just want to, amen, that's wonderful, that's a blessing. Just so you know, that won't save you. Now, we teach missions giving. We teach spreading the word here. I've already said some great things about it. I think it's very important. Amen. But it won't save you. No. But believing on the Lord Jesus Christ will. Amen. amen. And that's all it takes. And when you do that, you're done. There is nothing else. You don't have to say, okay, I'm saved now. I hope I can hold out faithful till the end of my life so I don't lose it. No. It is passed from death unto life. And shall not. What if you say, well, in the end, I'm afraid I'm going to come into condemnation because I do a real dirty sin when Jesus says, shall not come into condemnation. You're contradicting Jesus. Do you really want to do that? Even that couldn't make you lose. Because Jesus said you can't and he can't be wrong shall not come into condemnation, is passed from death unto life. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Mm -hmm. When you lived in sins, you were, spiritually speaking, dead. But now he has quickened you. Are you stronger than him? Are you able to put yourself back when he put you over here? 
again, you can hurt your fellowship with him. You can make it where you and him ain't close and you and him ain't talking much. Yeah, you can do that. But you can't lose your salvation because he has already passed you from death into life. John 10, the Gospel of John. We're in John 5. I'm going to read just a few pages over in chapter 10. Here's what Jesus says. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Let me tell you something, folks. You're just not strong enough to overcome Jesus and his Father both holding you in their hands and get yourself out. He says, no man is able to do that, doesn't he? You believe the word of God? Amen. If Jesus says, no man, and you're a man, or, if, or a woman, and that is, in mankind, are you stronger than them? Are you able to do that? I bet you're not. I bet you're not stronger than Jesus and his Father. He says you're not. He says you can't. He says eternal life, if you lived up to a certain point until you did a real bad sin and then lost it, was it eternal life or was it temporary? <laughs> and they shall never perish. If you perish and he says you shall never, there's a contradiction there, isn't there? Believe the word of God. All right, we've seen three major points in this verse. We've seen, number one, the importance of hearing God's word. Let me tell you what the devil wants. More than any other thing, he's concerned with being sure the word of God doesn't get spread and heard by as Amen. many people as possible. If you find a way you can spread the word or support somebody who is, and the Lord will bless you, that's his program for this age. You want to be involved in what God's got going? Be involved in spreading <laughs> his word. But Satan will fight you. There will be troubles, man. I hate to even think about those. There will be health troubles. There will be family problems. There will be job problems. There will, I, I can't think of all of them. Financial problems. But you'll be involved in the great work that God has going in this day and age. And you know what? He won't just lead you to the devil. He'll walk with you. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Jesus said. All of his prophets and all of his apostles went through persecution while they tried to serve him, but they had his presence while they tried to serve him. And here's the dirty little secret that people don't like to tell. If you live for the world, the flesh, and the devil, you'll have persecution there too. The difference is you won't have the power and the presence of God with you as you go through it. All right, so number one is the importance of hearing the word of God. Number two is the importance of believing God, which depends on you whether or not you choose to accept him and believe on him. Number three, the importance of realizing that upon receiving Christ, your everlasting life has begun. Has yours begun? Have you believed on Have you heard the word of God and believed on it and the Lord change you? I hope you have. There's nothing more important than that. And here in a minute, we're going to dismiss and we'll take just a few minutes to get the candidates for baptism ready. We'll be thinking about these things as we as we do these things. But we'll have just a verse or two of it.